أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين رب الشح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم كن وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوى وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Last week we were still speaking about the disobedience of Iblis May Allah curse him and how he refrained from prostrating for Adam Salam Allah alayhi we mentioned uh, how Iblis performed Qiyas according to Imam al-Sadiq and so we shed light on the concept of Qiyas what is Qiyas and how it should not be used um, when deriving Islamic laws because according to Ahlul Bayt if Qiyas was used to derive Islamic laws then it would terminate Islam it would annihilate Islam. After the lesson, if you remember, we had a few questions uh, that were posed, and some of them uh, pertain to the concept of Qiyas. We saw clearly how Qiyas does not work with our Islamic set of laws. We stopped at a tradition by Imam al Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, explaining the sajda, the prostration of the angels for Adam. We said, ultimately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only being in existence that deserves to be worshipped. We, Shia, Imamiyya, believe in Tawheed fil ibadah. There are multiple types of Tawheed, multiple forms of Tawheed. One of them is at tawheed fil ibadah, unity in worship. What does that mean? It means one cannot worship any being other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the only being who deserves to be worshipped is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That being said, when we come to sajda, sujood is an act of worship. So a question comes to mind when we read the, the verses that speak about the angels alayhi salam prostrating for Adam. And that is how could they have prostrated for Adam when they should only prostrate for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They should only worship Allah azza wa jal. So we said we'll read a few traditions by Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wasalam which explain this sajda and how it was not a form of worship for Adam alayhi salam. We started off with a hadith by Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. Let us reread the first portion of the hadith which we already read and explained and will continue wherever we left off. The Imam was asked, Can someone actually prostrate for someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Imam said what? He said no. So then the person asked the Imam alayhi salam, he said, If that's the case, then how come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, how come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the angels to prostrate for Adam alayhi salam? So the Imam said what? فَقَالَ إِنَّ مَنْ سَجَدَ بِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ سَجَدَ لِلَّهِ He said, he who prostrates due to Allah's command, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him to prostrate, that person or that individual has truly prostrated for Allah azza wa jal. Then he said, فَكَانَ سُجُودُهُ لِلَّهِ he said, as he was explaining further, he said that this individual's prostration was for God because it was a result of God's command. So the Imam is saying, he's telling us that ultimately since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the angels to prostrate, then their prostration is a worship. For who? It's a form of worship for God azza wa jal. Suppose that tomorrow, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells all of us, somehow, 
to prostrate for uh, Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salatu salam. I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm saying suppose Allah Ta'ala directs a command to us telling us prostrate for Imam al-Mahdi salam alayhi alayhi. What should we do at that point? Obviously, we should prostrate for him alayhi salam because if you prostrate for him due to Allah's command, you are in reality prostrating for Allah Azza wa Jal. Bear in mind, of course, bear in mind that according to our Islamic set of laws, as we said last week, according to our Islamic set of laws, we are not allowed to prostrate for anyone other than Allah Azza wa Jal. Not even for Ahlul Bayt. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim. Thus we have uh, beautiful uh, traditions that are in reality uh, part of ziyara, part of the ziyaras of Ahlul Bayt. You know, when we visit the Imams alayhim salatu salam, Ahlul Bayt salamullah alayhim teach us what to say. And in certain ziyaras, we're told to perform what we call salat al ziyara. Salat is ziyara. Here, someone who doesn't know our traditions well, and someone who's not uh, familiar with uh, the Shias and their beliefs, might believe that we're praying for the Imams, that we're actually doing salat for the infallible, when that's not the case. In some of those ziyaras, we have a dua right after the prayer, right after salat is ziyara, which explains what is salat is ziyara. Long story short, it's a prayer done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is sent as a gift to the Imam. In clear terms, it's a prayer done for God Azza wa Jal. You're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not the Imam when you're praying that particular prayer. But you send the reward of the prayer to the Imam. So it's a gift that you send to the Imam. Salamullahi alayhi. In the du'a that we recite after Salat al-Ziyara, the Imam teaches us to say that, Ya Allah, this prayer has been done for you and only you. And in it, he teaches us to say, Ya Allah, one cannot perform ruku, nor sujood, nor can he pray for anyone other than you. Hence, we said last week that we cannot bow down for uh, certain creations or any creation. Similarly, we cannot do sujood for any creation. Then the Imam alayhi <clears throat> salam said, speaking about Iblis, فَأَمَّا Iblis, فَعَبْدٌ خَلَقَهُ لِيَعْبُدَهُ وَيُوَحِّدَهُ He said, as for Iblis, he is a slave of God who was created by God. Why was he created by God? He says he was created by God to worship God and to believe in his unity. So the Imam salam is revealing for us that ultimately even Iblis, the arch enemy of God, was created for a good reason. He was created to be good and not to be evil. Then he said, وَقَدْ عَلِمَ حِينَ خَلَقَهُ مَا هُوَ وَإِلَى مَا يَصِيرُ He said that when Allah Ta'ala created uh, Iblis, He already knew what was Iblis and what shall he become in the future. As in He knew that this individual will rebel against Allah at a certain point and will turn into a devil. فَلَمْ يَزَلْ يَعْبُدْهُ فَلَمْ يَزَلْ يَعْبُدُهُ مَعْ مَلَائِكَتِهِ حَتَّى مْتَحَنَهُ بِسُجُودِ آدَمْ He said that Iblis kept on worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the angels of God until he was tested through the prostration for Adam. فَمْتَنَعَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ حَسَدًا He said alayhi salam that at that point Iblis refused to prostrate for Adam out of what? Out of envy. Then he said وَشَقَاوَةً غَلَبَتْ عَلَيْهِ وَشَقَاوَةً غَلَبَتْ عَلَيْهِ This is where we stop. What does shaqawa tan ghalabat alayh mean? Shaqawa, shaqawa is the opposite of sahada. So shaqawa means unhappiness. And sahada means happiness. So the imam is saying that 
uh, Iblis refused to prostrate for Adam alayhi salam for two reasons. One was his envy, and the other was his unhappiness. He says that the unhappiness of Iblis overwhelmed him, or his unhappiness defeated him. What does that mean? Bear in mind, I'm giving you a literal translation of the hadith right now. When he says, وَشَقَاوَةً غَلَبَتْ عَلَيْهِ we want to understand this part. What does this part actually mean? Ultimately, Iblis is like us, humans. Humans and jinns are similar. From what perspective? They're similar when it comes to taklif. Both creations are demanded by God subhanahu wa ta'ala to obey Him. Both creations were given the power to understand and they were given free will. Thus, jinns and humans may be good believers, and jinns and humans may be bad disbelievers. In better terms, both of these creations have the option of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dwelling in heaven, or disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dwelling in hellfire. Hence, as we've said before, there are jinns who are mu'mineen. There are jinns who are believers, who love Ahlul Bayt For example, when we come to the tragedy of Imam Hussain sallallahu alayhi wa there, there are certain lines of poetry written in the books of, Muq of Maqatil, the books called Maqtal al Hussain alayhi salam. There are certain lines of poetry that were recited by the jinns. Jinns had recited these lines of poetry mourning Aba Abdullah and Hussein alayhi salam. Which jinns are these? Obviously not Iblis, and not the likes of Iblis. Rather, they were jinns like us, individuals who love Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. On the other hand, there are jinns who are disobedient. They are obedient to Iblis and disobedient to God Azza wa Jal. The same applies to mankind. You have good humans and you have evil humans, although everyone essentially was what was good. Everyone was created pure, but the jinns and the humans sometimes deviate and choose to be evil. That being said, now we can understand what the, the meaning of shaqawatan ghalabat alayh. Since both of these creations, humans and jinns, have free will and have the option of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or disobeying Him, this means that both of them have the option of being happy or unhappy in the hereafter. How will you be happy? You'll be happy in the hereafter if you dwell in heaven. And you'll be unhappy if you dwell in hellfire. So when the Imam says, shaqawatan ghalabat alayh, he means to say that there was some part in Iblis which called him to do what? Which called him to sin. And he gave in to that part. He gave in to that part in him which called him to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gave in to that part and as a result became unhappy. He became what? From the dwellers of Hellfire. The sad thing about Shaitan is what? The sad thing is he himself sealed his fate. He himself uh, chose to dwell in Hellfire. Why do I say this? Because even though he disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by refusing to prostrate for Adam alayhi salam, he could have apologize to God and he could have said Ya Allah I'm sorry I went through a moment of arrogance I don't know what happened to me you know I felt weak against my desire or my anger etc and now I want to repent and I'm going to do sajda for Adam alayhi salam you know if he did that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have eventually accepted his repentance Allah ta'ala tawab Tawab means what? It's one of his names. It means he is a God who accepts repentance in abundance. Not once or twice. He keeps on accepting the repentance of his creations. And he is Rahim, extremely merciful. 
So if he actually turned to God and said, Ya Allah, Samihni, I'm sorry, I did wrong, and it was an hour of weakness. Now I want to do sajda for Adam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have accepted his repentance. But the problem is what? The problem is he persisted at sinning, and up until today, he still persists and will continue to persist in sinning until the day of, until the day of his death. Instead of using his life, his long life, to actually repent, he's using it to do what? To exact his revenge upon Adam through me and you, by deviating me and you, which is quite unfortunate. Then the Imam said, فَلَعَنَهُ عِنْدَ ذَلِكَ At that point, when he refused to prostrate for Adam السلام, Allah Ta'ala cursed him. Cursing him means what? Remember we explained the meaning of cursing last week. It means he pushed him away from his mercy. وَأَخْرَجَهُ عَنْ صُفُوفِ الْمَلَائِكَةِ The Imam says that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala brought Iblis out of the ranks of the angels. And that indicates that his level dropped in the eyes of God. He dropped from the level of an angel to a devil. He became the devil. Next he says, وَأَنزَلَهُ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ مَدْحُورًا And Allah brought him down to earth. Madhura. Madhur means mubadan. So when he was brought down to earth, he was not brought down to earth with honor with respect. Rather, he was kicked out or exiled from the place in which he would reside. That indicates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was angry at Iblis. Sometimes you have creations of God that come down to earth, but they come down with honor. They come down with, an, with a holy mission. For example, the angels alayhim salam the angels every night of destiny come down to earth, right? تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ فِيهَا Allah says that the angels and the spirit come down every night of destiny. They came down last year and they'll come down next year, inshallah, in Shahar Ramadan. They come down upon who? According to our traditions, they come down upon the hujjah, the proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, on earth. So they used to come down on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was the proof of God on earth. Then they used to come down upon Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam when he was the proof of God on earth. And today they come down on Sahib al-Asr al-Zaman. May Allah hasten his reappearance since he is the proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. This of course doesn't make our Imams prophets. Keep that in mind. The last prophet is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. But this is something that uh, the hujaj, the proofs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who are prophets and non-prophets share. They share this uh, trait, that the angels and the ruh descend upon them on the night of destiny. When the angels come down, it's not that they're coming down because Allah ta'ala is angry with them, right? They're coming down with a mission, with a holy mission. With Iblis, no, he came down because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kicked him out from where he was residing. Then he says, فَصَارَ عَدُوَّ آدَمْ وَوُلْدَهُ بِذَلِكَ السَّبَابِ Due to that reason, Iblis became the enemy of Adam and his children. وَمَا لَهُ مِنَ السَّلْطَنَ عَلَى وُلْدِهِ إِلَّا الْوَسْوَسَةِ now the Imam alayhi salam, Imam Sadiq, went on explaining uh, what kind of powers does Iblis have when coming to uh, misguiding people. Can he force people into sin? Can he actually, you know, force me to drink wine, force me to walk to a bar, force me to listen to music, etc. The Imam said no. He said yes, he became your enemy, but the only thing he could do, the only thing he can do, is call you to sin and whisper. 
So shaitan can only encourage us to sin. Meaning he adds fuel to the fire. I'm not sure if you remember, but we said before that there is a part in us, fallible human beings, in the fallible human beings, called in nafs al ammara This part calls us to do what? To sin, to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can consider this to be an inner devil, an inner devil. A shaitan, Iblis, may Allah curse him, and other shayateen, such as other jinns or certain human beings, they add fuel to the fire, they aid this inner call. But they can't force you. If you don't want to sin, you're not going to sin. Jayid, they add pressure on you. Shaitan beautifies the sin because he wants you to do it. So he beautifies it for you. He's, he tries to strengthen your you know, desire or anger. But ultimately, it's your choice and my choice. Then the Imam says, وَقَدْ أَقَرَّ مَا مَعْصِيَتِهِ لِرَبِّهِ بِرُبُوبِيَتِهِ This is a marvelous segment. He says, even though Iblis disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he still acknowledged that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord of the universe. So he never denied the fact that Allah ta'ala was the Lord in existence. He never denied Allah's lordship. Thus, you, you, you see in the Quran, he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do what? To delay his punishment and to grant him respite. That in itself indicates that he's admitting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord in this universe because he's asking him to grant him his need. And that's part of what? Lordship. Part of lordship, rububiyyah, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfills your needs. Do we have a, a question on uh, this hadith before I continue? No questions? Jayid. Let's move on to another hadith. There's another hadith by Imam al Rida sallallahu alayhi wa that also explains the sajda for Adam and it connects that sajda, that prostration with Ahlul Bayt alayhim wa salat wa salam. Let me copy and paste the hadith for you. It's a long hadith. It's a long hadith found in the book Uyun Akhbar al Rida. In it, Imam al Rida alayhi salatu salam uh, mentions um, the Ma'raj, the night journey of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Uh, he mentions certain events that took place and he mentions how Ahlul Bayt are superior to the angels. Salamullah alayhim. So one reason that he presents to explain how they're superior to the angels uh, is the prostration for Adam alayhi salam. What does he say? He says, ثم إن الله تبارك وتعالى خلق آدم فأودعنا صلبه He says, surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then created Adam and he instilled us, Ahlul Bayt, in his sulb, in his sulb. Uh, Solub means spine, Wallahu alam, based on um, the my, my Arabic knowledge, based on the 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 meaning of solub that dictionaries present. Solub in this context is the uh, spine, or you can say the vertebral colon or the backbone. So he says. That Adam alayhi salam, that Allah Ta'ala instilled us, Ahlul Bayt, salamullah alayhim, he instilled them, their lights, where? In Adam's uh, spine alayhi salam, or in a part of Adam. Then he says, وَأَمَرَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ بِالسُّجُودِ لَهُ تَعْظِيمًا 
Then he commanded the angels to prostrate for Adam. Ta'zeeman lana. Ta'zeeman lana. So the first reason Allah Ta'ala commanded the angels to prostrate for Adam alayhi uh, salam, the first reason why he commanded them to prostrate for Adam was so that they glorify Ahlul Bayt. He says, Ta'zeeman lana wa ikraman. So they glorify us and they honor us. Then he says, وَكَانَ سُجُودُهُمْ لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ عُبُودِيَّةِ He says that when they prostrated, they were prostrating, and their prostration was a form of worship to God. وَلِآدَمَ إِكْرَامًا And they were honoring Adam through that prostration. وَطَاعَةً لِكَوْنِنَ فِي صُلْبِهِ He says, and they were honoring Adam and they were submitting to Adam السلام, because we were in his spine or in that specific part of Adam. Then he says, فَكَيْفَ لَا نَكُونْ أَفْضَلْ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ He says then, if that, that being the case, how can we not be greater than the angels? وَقَدْ سَجَدُوا لِآدَمَ كُلُّهُمْ أَجْمَعُونَ How could we not be greater than the angels when all of them all of the angels prostrated for Adam. So long story short, Imam al is saying السلام, that the angels were commanded to prostrate for Adam because we, Ahlul Bayt, were placed inside Adam salawatullahi alayhim ajma'in. Which is a clear proof indicating Ahlul Bayt are superior to the angels of God salamullahi alayhim. We have a third tradition <coughs> Found in the book Tafsir al Askari, Tafsir al Askari, uh, which is uh, a book containing um, explanations of Imam al Askari uh, concerning the verses of Surah al Fatiha and Surah al Baqarah. Uh, in it, Imam al Askari is narrated to have said that the angels. When the angels prostrated for Adam, Adam was their qibla. He was their qibla. So Adam to the angels was like the Kaaba to us. When we prostrate towards the Kaaba, we're doing so. Why? Because Allah Ta'ala told us, when you pray, face the Kaaba. And when you prostrate in prayer, face the Kaaba. Correct? But are you worshipping the Kaaba? No. You're facing it, you're directing yourself to it because Allah told you to do so. But in reality, you're worshipping God, Azza wa Jal. And the same applies to Adam according to Imam al-Askari's tafsir. He was their qibla and they prostrated towards Adam when in reality the prostration was for Allah Jalla Jalalu. These three ahadith, the hadith of Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al rida and Imam al-Askari sallallahu alayhim uh, give us a clear idea regarding the sajda of the angels and how it was not a form of worship uh, for Adam alayhi salam. That being said, we move on to a new verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 35. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمُ اسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةِ وَكُلَا مِنْهَا رَغَدًا حَيْثُ شِئْتُمَا وَلَا تَقْرَبَا هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ فَتَكُونَا مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ So here we see that the story of Adam alayhi salam in his heaven or his garden begins. The story begins. And remember, this is the main reason why we are uh, learning about Adam alayhi salam. We want to understand what took place when he was in that garden and how does his so-called disobedience not contradict his infallibility. Up until now, what have we confirmed? We need to remember the main points that we've confirmed based on the Qur'an and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. We've confirmed that Adam alayhi, was created to reside where? To reside on earth. Jayid, 
He was created to come down to earth. Keep that point in mind. Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. He was created for earth, not for that garden of his, not for that jannah. Secondly, we've confirmed that Adam is superior to the angels and that Adam was not like, uh, was not as some people like to say, dumb, astaghfirullah rabbi wa or ignorant. On the contrary, the Prophet salam, Prophet Adam had immense knowledge. And I believe the verses that we dissected when Allah tells him, Ya Adam anbi'hum bi asma'ihim, shows us that indeed he was not a, a, a dumb or gullible human being. Astaghfirullah. Rather, he was knowledgeable. He had immense knowledge. He had knowledge that was part of ilm al ghayb the knowledge of the unseen, with Allah's permission, of course. So we've confirmed that. Uh, he was created for earth. He was created to come down to earth. He is superior to the angels, that he had immense knowledge, knowledge that not even the angels of God had. And last but not least, all of the angels were commanded to prostrate for Adam a.s. It's essential to keep these points in mind in order to understand his story in the garden. So we start with verse 35 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah says, and we said, O Adam, dwell, you and your wife, in the garden, and eat from it a plenteous food wherever you wish, and do not approach this tree, for then you will be of the unjust. This is, of course, the translation of Shakir pertaining to verse 35 of Surah Al-Baqarah. When we read this verse, several questions come to mind. Several questions. I don't think we'll have time to answer all these questions tonight, but uh, let's pose them, or let's pose some of these questions. The first one is, what is the Jannah of Adam a.s.? What is it? Was it the Jannah, the paradise that the believers will enter on the Day of Judgment, or not? That's one question. Second question which comes to mind is when Allah says لا تقربا هذه الشجرة Do not approach this tree. What kind of command is this? It's a command, right? He's telling him not to approach the tree. So what kind of command is it? That's a very important question. Thirdly, what's so special about this tree? When he says, لا تقربا هذه الشجرة Do not approach this tree. What's so special about it? In order for God subhanahu wa ta'ala to tell Adam not to approach it. And lastly, um, what will happen if he approaches it? Jayid, what will happen if Adam approaches that tree? Now, before I start uh, at least answering the first question, um, we need to understand one point, and that is Adam's story, Adam's story in the garden, uh, that story has been mentioned in the Holy Quran three times. Yeah, it's been mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-A'raf, and Surah Taha. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Ta'ala summarizes the story. Whereas in Taha, He gives much more detail. So in order to understand it well, we need to do what? We need to connect the verses together. We need to connect the verses together to have a full understanding of the story or a better understanding of the story, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's start off with the first question. What was the paradise in which Adam alayhi salam Sorry, not the paradise, the garden in which Adam السلام, was told to uh, reside in. What was that garden? Here it's important to understand the meaning of Jannah from a literal perspective. Jannah, the word Jannah, has three root letters. Jim, Noon, Noon, Jim, Noon, Noon. When these three letters 
or the root letters of a particular word, they indicate that uh, something is being concealed, something is being hidden. Let me give you an example. What do we call a fetus in Arabic? A fetus is called a janin. Right? A fetus is called a janin. The root letters of janin are what? Jim, noon, noon. Why is it called a janin? Because you can't see it. It's hidden in the mother's womb, in its mother's womb. A second example. What do we call a madman in Arabic? Someone who's crazy. Majnoon. Majnoon. Again, the three root letters are jim, noon, noon. Why do Arab people, uh, why do the Arabs call someone who's delusional majnoon? Because it's as if his intellect is what? Concealed. There's something blocking that individual from uh, using his intellect. That's the second example. A third example is jinns. These creations that we can't see are called what? Jinns. The root, the root letters are what? Jim, noon, noon. They're called jinns because you don't see them. There's a barrier between humans and these so-called jinns. The same applies to Jannah. The literal meaning of Jannah is Gordon. That's why I kept on saying the Gordon of Adam, the Gordon of Adam, alayhi salam. Um, the literal meaning of Jannah is Gordon. Why do Arabs call a Gordon Jannah? Because for one of two reasons, if not both. Because parts of the garden conceal other parts, or because due to its uh, plants and herbs, the, the, the color green sometimes uh, is, is viewed as if it's black. So due to the abundant amount of uh, green plants and herbs, you'll, you'll realize that some parts of the uh, garden are being concealed. So the issue goes back to what? To concealment. If we understand this, then we'll understand that when Allah says, Uskun anta wa zawjukal jannah, uh, this Jannah doesn't have to be the abode of the believers on the Day of Judgment. It doesn't have to be that. Because any garden, any garden, even the gardens we have outside our houses, can be called Jannah. The garden you have in the backyard, for example, is a Jannah. It's your Jannah. Jayid. So... The word Jannah in itself doesn't indicate that Adam السلام, was told to dwell where? He was told to dwell in the heaven, the paradise in which believers will dwell on the day of judgment, after they receive their judgment, of course. You might ask me, why are you, are you telling us this? Well, firstly, because the hadith of Ahlul Bayt السلام, spoke about it. Secondly, it can clear up some confusion regarding Iblis. Uh, people sometimes ask, how was Iblis able to enter the garden of Adam alayhi salam? Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, didn't Allah azza wa jal pull him out of heaven? Didn't he tell him to get out of heaven? So how did he come back into heaven? One answer is, who said he went back into heaven? Who said the garden of Adam was heaven? It might have been some sort of garden uh, found in a part in this universe outside heaven, outside the paradise or the heaven in which the believers will reside on the day of judgment. 
In fact, this is what the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt say. We have multiple ahadith speaking about this issue. One hadith is the following. Let me send it to you. You can find it in Tafsir al Mizan, Alama Tabatabai Rahmatullah Ale, cites Tafsir al Qummi. So the tradition goes back to Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. He was asked, Su'il al Sadiq alayhi salam, an Jannati Adam, a min jinan dunya kanat, a min jinan al akhira. He was asked, was the garden of Adam from the gardens of this world or the gardens of the hereafter? So the Imam said what? He said, كانت من جنان الدنيا. It was from the gardens of this world. أطلعوا فيها الشمس والقمر the, 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 the sun and the moon would rise in that specific garden. وَلَوْ كانت من جنان الآخرة ما خرج منها أبدا. It's as if that garden was from the gardens of the hereafter, then Adam alayhi salam wouldn't have come out of it. He would have resided in that uh, garden for eternity. Because Jannah, the paradise that inshallah will enter ta'ala on the day of judgment, uh, is called Jannah al Khul. If you enter it, you don't leave it. You remain there. Yes, Allah Ta'ala can bring you out if He wants to, but He won't. The dwellers of heaven, once they enter heaven, they remain in heaven for eternity, forever. So according to this hadith, the Imam alayhi salam is saying, if Adam was residing in the heaven, in paradise, then he, would, he wouldn't have come out of it. Any questions? Fine. The second question we posed was what? What is this tree that Adam alayhi salam was told not to approach? Before we answer this question, let's go to the third question, which was, what type of command was Allah's command when he said, لا تقربا هذه الشجرة Do not approach the tree. Here we need to understand a really important point, brothers and sisters, a really important point. Allah's commands are of different types. Sometimes Allah's command is what we call Amr Mawlawi. Amr Mawlawi means what? It means his command must be obeyed. And if you defy his command, you deserve what? Punishment. So any command which falls under this category, Amr Mawlawi, you can also call it Amr Wajib. Um, if you defy this type of command, you will deserve what? Punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you must perform these commands. For example, when Allah tells us to pray the five daily prayers, Jayyid, that's Amr Mawlawi. Allah doesn't give you the choice of defying Him or disobeying Him. He tells you, you have to pray five times a day. And if you don't, then prepare yourselves for uh, unbearable punishments. Similarly, when Allah tells us, for example, not to fornicate, to avoid, to refrain from zina, ma'adullah, or to refrain from drinking wine or eating pork, that's amr mawlaw. He doesn't give you the choice. You have to do it. If you don't refrain from those deeds, then prepare yourselves for what? For unbearable punishment in the hereafter. 
These are what? Examples of Amr Mawlawi. Another example pertaining to Adam's story is the command that was directed to the angels when they were told to prostrate. That was Amr Mawlawi. Because we saw as soon as Iblis refused to prostrate for Adam, what did Allah do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala casted him out of the ranks of the angels salam. He got angry at him. He cursed him. And he dropped from the level of an angel to a devil. So it was Amr Mawla. It means he didn't have the choice of uh, refraining from prostrating for Adam salam. However, not all of God's commands or awamir mawlawiyya. We have other types of commands from God Azza wa Jal. For example, we have what we call Amr Nadbi, or if you want, call it Amr Istihbabi. What's Amr Nadbi or Amr Istihbabi? It's a command that you can disobey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, perform X, Y, and Z. But he gives you the option of performing it or not. If you perform it, he rewards you. If you don't perform it, he doesn't punish you. So his amr, his command, encourages you to do what? To actually perform X, Y, and Z. But it's not a must. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you through the Quran or Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, that this command can be defied. You can disobey it. I don't encourage you to disobey it, but you can. If you disobey it, then you will not uh, be punished in the hereafter. Do we have examples? Yes, we do. Plenty of examples. Think of all the mustahabbat you know, such as performing Tasbih al-Zahra alayhi salam after prayer. Does Allah want me to perform Tasbih al-Zahra after prayer? Yes, He does. He wants you to do it. Meaning He tells you, Ya Fulan, Ya Fulana, Ya Hammam, do it after prayer. But I have the option of doing it or not. If I don't do it, He won't punish me. Yes, I will lose a lot of rewards, a lot of benefits, but that's my loss. It's my choice to gain those benefits or not. Think of Salat al-Layl. Salat al-Layl is mustahab. It's very recommended, highly recommended. It was wajib upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But upon us, it's recommended. Tayyib, if I willfully sleep at night, no, no, no. Every night I wake up for Salat al-Layl and I willfully sleep. It's not that I sleep and I don't wake up. I wake up and I willfully go back to sleep knowing that I'm not going to pray Salat al-Layl. Will Allah punish me? No, He won't. Will I lose a great amount of benefit? Yes, I will. It's a Amr Istihbabi. He tells me, pray Salat al but the choice is mine. Jayid. A third example is fasting. Fasting in general is mustahab, except on certain days. It's haram, such as the days of Eid. And except on certain days in which it's disliked. Like, for example, the day of Arafah, if you're going to fast, knowing that fasting will <clears throat> weaken you. It will weaken you and it won't allow you to um, supplicate. In that case, it's makruh. It's disliked to fast the day of Arafah. Or fasting the day of Arafah when there's a possibility, it's not Arafah, it's actually Eid al-Adha. Here it's also makruh. The fast, the day of Arafah, meaning the reward of, of, of fasting that day uh, reduces. But in general, fasting is mustahab. طيب. Suppose someone does not fast any recommended fast. He only fasts the wajib fasts, such as Shahr Ramadan. That's it. Will Allah punish him? No. Will he have lost some benefits? Yes, he will. So that's Amr Istihbabi. Jayil. Do we have a third type of Amr? Yes, we do. Amr Irshadi. What's Amr Irshadi? Amr Irshadi is a command which reveals for you that if you do a particular deed, you will benefit. 
And if you don't do it, you will be harmed to a certain extent. So it's a, it's a command that you can defy, a command that you can disobey. But the person who's commanding you, the individual who's commanding you, is doing so in order to tell you that um, you should watch out and you should do X, Y, and Z in order to protect yourself from harm and to gain a particular benefit. Let me give you an example. Take the example of uh, doctors. When a doctor knows you're healthy, you have absolutely no health problems. But then again, he gives you a bit of health advice, telling you to eat, for example, these foods and to refrain from those foods. You tell the doctor, Shh, is, is it a must? Do I have to listen to these, you know, to these words? Do I have to obey you? He tells you no. Okay, if you don't want to obey me, that's your choice. Uh, but I'm telling you to eat these foods because I want you to be healthier. And I'm telling you to avoid these foods because I don't want your health to be harmed whatsoever. Even if the harm is little or small. That's Amr Irshadi. Let me give you another example. Um, suppose that a child has a karate tournament that he wants to attend. And his father tells him not to go to the tournament because he doesn't want him to get hurt. Now the, the father knows that ultimately his child won't die and he won't get harmed severely. But out of his compassion, he doesn't want his child to bear any harm, even if the harm is little or small. So he tells him not to go to the tournament. That's Amr Irshadi. Because he knows if he goes to the tournament, even if he gets the trophy, he's going to have to go through what? Through an amount of pain. Since he will be facing strong opponents. So he tells him, don't go to the tournament. Now the child tells his father, uh, Father, yani if I go, you will be displeased with me? He tells him, no, no, I won't be displeased with you. You can still go. But I advise you not to go because I don't want you to bear that harm. That's what Amr Irshad. Jayid. Now the question is, if we've understood these different types of awamir, these different types of commands, the question is, when Allah Ta'ala told Adam, لا تقربه, when he told Adam and Eve, لا تقربه هذه الشجرة, which command was that? Was it Amr? Mawlawi or Amr uh, Istihbabi or Amr Irshadi. What we can say for sure is it was not Amr Mawlawi. There is no doubt it was not Amr Mawlawi. Which explains to us how Adam didn't sin, alayhi salam, even though he approached the truth. Ultimately, I think all of us have heard the story. Adam السلام, will approach the tree and he will disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As in he won't, you know, um, listen to that specific command. La taqraba hadihi shajara. Even then his deed is not a sin. Because the amr itself, the command was not mawlawi. It was not a command that he had to perform. He had the choice of actually approaching the tree or not. Was it Amr Istihbabi? Some of our scholars say yes, it was Amr Istihbabi. Or they incline towards this opinion. Like Sayyid al Murtada, Alam al Huda, Rahmatullah, alayh, Sharif al Murtada, in his book Tanzih al Anbiya, he says or uh, he inclines towards this uh, opinion. He accepts it or he, or he inclines towards it. Whereas we have other scholars like Allama Tabatabai Rahmatullah and Shaykh Muhammad Jawad al Balaghi, his teacher, Rahmatullah, who say it was Amr Irshadi. It was Amr Irshadi. So what we need to do now is we need to present proof 
indicating that the Amr, the command, was not Mawlawi. And that's what we'll, we'll, we'll be doing, inshallah, next week. If we're still alive, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala al-Mustafa Muhammadin wa alihi al-Tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa alihi Muhammad wa ajil farajahum.